Welcome to the Rusted Garden Homestead. In today's episode of Garden Ramblings, I'm going to walk through the garden, show you what I'm doing. We've not really had enough rain to do much in the last 21 days, so my plants are beat up. The whole idea in June is to really address pest diseases, get your plants in shape so that they really produce, and I'll be talking about that. These are daylilies. Beautiful plants, beautiful flowers, 100% edible. I have a new book coming out called Growing an Edible Landscape. It will be out in November. Daylilies, and I want to stress daylilies, not regular lilies, uh, because regular lilies are toxic. Daylilies, you can eat the flowers. They're crispy, they're great in salads. You can eat the buds, you can pickle them, you can put them in stir fries, you can do all kinds of different things with them. I eat these regularly and I'm incorporating more and more uncommon plants into my garden so that my landscape becomes a little bit more edible. More daylilies in there, fruiting bushes. I have rhubarb, grapevine, grapevine fruit tree. I'll be putting in flowers in there. There's even leeks in there. So you can set your garden up in different ways that it looks nice, as an ornamental place. These are actually regular li lilies back here. You would not eat those. So you can incorporate flowers, edible plants, all kinds of different things into your beds throughout your property. You don't just need a traditional garden, but that's a way to bring more food into your property. This is my nectarine tree. I did support it. I put in notches with these two by fours. The fruit is doing really, really well. I've been keeping up all my spraying. I've been thinning the fruit out. In some branches, I'm leaving more fruit on. I want to see what the tree does, but it is actually dropping fruit. It seems like when it needs to, that they know what to do. I want to come right in here. These are German butterball. No, these are French fing fingerling peppers, um, peppers, potatoes, and they are indeterminate variety. I've been talking before that I've had a trouble figuring out what potatoes are indeterminate, what potatoes are determinate. So indeterminate French fingerling, one variety that's going on my list, I could keep putting soil on there or mounding that up and it would grow potatoes out the vine. So potatoes do vary. You have the determinate varieties, the indeterminate varieties. This is my garlic. I want to show you this because people have had a lot of questions. This is soft neck garlic that I got from Costco. I put in, just pushed it down about an inch, uh, maybe March. And I pulled some out yesterday, well, two days ago, and it's, you know, formed nice garlic bulbs. So you can put in soft neck garlic early in the spring in most areas, and you're going to get some garlic out of there. So I'll be harvesting that soon. This space is looking good with all the different sages. Hard neck garlic over here, hard neck garlic. These are scapes. Some people say to um, you know, break them off. I just leave them on there. I pulled this out the same time. It's not huge for hardneck garlic bulb, but it's beautiful to me. So these are getting close to being ready to come out of the ground. And you're just waiting for more yellowing to occur and you know, they'll just look like they're fading. You can eat scapes. You want to catch them a little bit earlier than that. Some people like to break them off. They think that it takes energy from the forming garlic bulb. I'm not sure if it does. If it does, it's not enough to really kind of deter me from just letting them grow. Onions are looking good. Got some cantaloupe volunteers in there that I'm going to keep. They are starting to bulb up. And remember, onions bulb not based on how old they are, but based on how long the days are in your area. You have early days and intermediate days, long day onions or short day onions. They look pretty good. I had something happen in here. I didn't know if it was because I wasn't watering them or some insects came in. Anyway, I treated it with dust and I really had to up watering in my garden because I wasn't really paying attention. I was bragging about how much rain Maryland gets. And really for the last 14, 21 days, we are not getting enough rain. So I let my ground dry out and then like I would water the uh, potato plants, they would suck all the water out. They would look good, but they were leaving the ground dry. If your ground dries out, so to speak, and then you water your plants, you're going to have to come in the next day and water again. Because that first round of watering, your starving plants or your thirsty plants are going to pull the water into their system. The ground's going to be dry again. And just in 24 hours, 48 hours of the sun coming down, 
they're gonna get dehydrated again. So you have to sometimes water back-to-back -back days just to get everything back in shape. And my potatoes look good now. They're starting to fade. I've checked that potatoes under there. There are some, uh, there is some damage in there from the potato beetle, but your potato plants can take something ridiculous, like 50% damage, 75% damage on the leaves, and the potatoes will be fine. So the dusting has reduced the population. The damage is still there. However, it's under control. I'm going to get a huge potato harvest. These are pepper plants, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, about 20... Six actually because I only put two down there they're starting to green up they're starting to look good they were struggling a bit a week ten days ago not enough water just keep them watered once the root systems really take hold your pepper plants are going to take off the plants are loving the warm weather we're having the nights are even cool but we're just not getting any rain and I've just added in some cantaloupe which I'm going to be growing up this cage, old rusted fencing, two plants in there, and I should be able to just move the plants around, spray them, take care of them, and I'll have to support the cantaloupe in there because they're going to get heavy and they can pull off the vine or they can damage the vine if they're, you know, if you're growing vertically. But it's a great way to save space. Quick look. The peaches are looking pretty good. So let's walk into the garden. I want to go in from the other side because I want to show you all the blueberries that are producing. I'm in the process of setting up the greenhouse space and trying to decide what I'm going to be doing with it for the summer. Everything is out of the greenhouse. I'm going to pot up that which can be potted up, throw away that which should be thrown away, put down some mulch, just cleaning up the area. But I'm going to be growing a lot of plants in pints and gallon containers, backup plants, plants for next year, etc. But I'm really liking this space. Coming into the garden, the muscadines are looking good. They're going to have to be trimmed back a little bit when we get inside there. But I'm really excited. Really, I mean, probably once I start gardening in uh, April and plants start coming up, I always find something exciting in the garden. Blueberry plants are where they should be. Nice and green. I've had to water these twice. You want to, even though they have deep roots and can take care of themselves, with all the blueberries forming, don't forget to water your blueberry plants. Just FYI, blueberry plants do like more acidic soil, and I basically give them some acidic water soluble in the beginning of the season, and then maybe again at the end of the season, and that keeps the pH fine. They, they can grow nicely in a wide range of pH, and my soil tends to be more alkaline, but a little acidic water soluble uh, fertilizer I think really helps them out. All this just beautiful growth. So these plants are getting bigger and bigger. I had to put in T-posts. You'll see them throughout the plantings here and pull up the branches and tie them up. But I'm just going to give you a quick look. You know at all the blueberries that are forming. And a good tip is to grow early producing, early season blueberries mid-season blueberries and late-season blueberries. This way they're coming in at all different times. And I've been eating the blueberries out of here really for the last week. Like this is a late-season blueberry right here. There's not much on there but that's perfect because I don't want all the fruit coming at once because a lot is going to go to waste. And we could kind of keep going down there, at least I could, and just show them off. And as they turn purple they're going to get plumper and bigger, so, you know, go from a small green size to a nice big plump purple size. The ginger is starting to come up. I cleared out, and part of the reason I had to put in the post were it was just too much shade. So it was shading out the ginger bed in here, which likes to be protected from the sun that beats down on it, but it was getting too much. So that's going to get some water-soluble fertilizer, but the ginger's looking good. I've pruned back my peaches, my nectarine. Uh, tree again. Blackberries all looking good. I mean I'm gonna have thousands of blackberries and you can see more blueberries. They're still green in some areas. This is just a fun part of the garden when everything is starting to take off. It's still early morning here. I have my dust down. This is spinosad everywhere you're gonna see it and it'll show you how I'm using it to keep um, the pests off my plants. Like right now in June, my whole goal is water, keep them strong, 
reduce the pests, reduce the diseases, let them, you know, get to a place where they can really take off and go crazy. This is one tomato vine in here that I keep sprawling across and letting it root out. It's looking good. I'll take a look real quick. This is my vertical tower and you, you probably know I am affiliated with Greenstock, best tower on the market. Time to feed these guys. They're getting watered. The tomatoes here don't look the best. The color isn't right. You want it to look something like this. Much more green. Looks a lot better. And it's just probably that tier has more fertilizer in it. I tend to grow in the bottom tier less sometimes. So I think I had all the nutrients sucked out of the levels right here. So they're going to just get some AgriThrive, some water-soluble fertilizer. This kale is going to come out. I, I want to be in love with dinosaur kale. It's just a little bit too thick. I love the name. I like how it looks. I just don't use it a lot. So it's in my garden, but that's going to be one kale that I'm going to stop growing. Strawberries are looking good. I've interplanted. These are alpine strawberries, by the way. Last year I hated them, and I said they're not worth growing. Now I've kind of gotten used to the taste. They're kind of like, people say, like a jelly bean, um, a candy. They just have a different flavor. So you just kind of, you know, pick them as if they're little jelly beans and they produce the whole summer and it's a nice little treat, but they look good. The strawberries are coming back. The peppers are looking good, good size, nice and thick. Have a tomato plant down there. I'm putting the tomato plants, determinate varieties, lower in the tier because they do grow up and I don't want them up top shading everything down. I mean, look at the pepper plant in here. So you definitely can grow peppers in the vertical towers. And years ago I did videos on it. I think I planted up just about every pocket with the pepper plants. And as long as you can keep up with the watering, you can really put in a lot of plants. Like you could put six pepper plants in here. Good example. This pepper doesn't look the best either. So it tells me all the fertilizer in here just needs a good water soluble mix poured into it. You can put in peppers into all the pockets. As long as you can keep them fed and watered, they're going to be great. I do recommend now maybe three peppers per um, tier. So you have six pockets. So it'd be three pockets full of peppers and you can put something else in there. It just makes it a little bit easier on you when you have to water it. More dinosaur kale. Some of the caterpillars are coming in, starting to chew it down. So that's why I dusted everything last night. This is where I'm growing sunflowers. All direct seed, those cages keep the rabbit that loves visiting in here from coming in and just chewing them all down. So I'm gonna, and it looks like some of the, just taking a look, some of the sunflowers are dying off. Not sure why, but I'm keeping this area watered. I will replace the sunflowers that die off with more seed and we'll see how it goes. But those dish racks, those inverted dish racks, keep rabbits and chip, chipmunks from eating them, depending on the size of the cage. This is a purple potted bean, seeded itself, one plant, looks brilliant and beautiful, and I'm gonna just grow it right up here. I'll probably put in some, you'll see some PVC over there, right on this side, so that keeps growing. What I'm not doing is last year I had one, two, three, four, probably six, eight, ten purple potted beans in this space, and it was just too many. So I'm growing less beans, bean plants, so that I can take care of them better, but I'm going to get just as much production out of them. Fewer plants, better care, you still can get a great harvest. Jalapenos are starting to come in. I forget how many's in there. Less than I did two years ago. I think I went from 24 to 16, just because I didn't need as much um, or I didn't need them all. I didn't eat, eat them all. I couldn't even give them away. Wanted a little bit more spacing in there. Tomatoes are looking good. I'll be showing you some in another part of my garden. Whole key for tomatoes, really, in my opinion. Mulch, keep the upper part of the soil moist. Top two, four, six, eight inches. That really allows the surface roots to collect nutrients, water, of course. Without water, they can't pull in nutrients. That's why they start to look yellow. Um, they're thirsty, of course, but they also can't move the available N, P, and K from the soil into their system because there's not enough moisture. Shallow watering really works well for tomato plants. Deep waterings are good, but keeping that top portion, really for most of your plants, keeping that top four, six inches uh, saturated makes a huge difference. Marigolds look good. 
Uh, what do we have? Seven tomatoes in here. That's the little tomato I was talking about before. He is not growing, and it was really a discussion I was having with you all about does a sunflower affect plants around it? And maybe it's true. I mean, that guy's just staying small. The root systems of the sunflower, if that's true, doesn't seem don't seem to be affecting the rest of the plants, but just the one that's planted really, you know, in close proximity. The Bug Hotel, marigolds look good. All the peppers in the sunken container, they're taking off. And the reason you do that is because watering is really easy. I just flood the top of that pot. Enough water soaks down. The peppers are happy. The bottoms are open. The roots get into the earth. Put all the resources right into the pot. The plants look good. Still deciding what I'm going to do with these. I don't want to get rid of them. But you can see they're the same age as some of the peppers that you see in the pots. They're starting to flower. They even have peppers on there. When the roots of a plant are constrained, you might think, oh, you got a beautiful transplant, but it's really going into flowering and fruit production mode, and it's, you know, a little bit messed up. You can correct it, especially with peppers. Just give them a bigger space. Roots take off. The plants grow. So we'll see what I do with all those. But the peppers look good. The shade cloth over the cabbage and the broccoli. Let's go on this side so you can see the broccoli. All the broccoli has to be harvested really today. I'm having some friends over and this is what we'll be eating. The spinosad is on the outer leaves because as soon as you see these holes like right there that means you have the cabbage worm and if I started looking around I would up find them. Starting to get a little bit loose but I call that success. I told you I struggle with getting broccoli in the spring using this 50% shade cloth right from the get-go has made a big difference and if I let this go much longer it's going to loosen up and it's going to start to flower so it's time to eat that and all the cabbage looks good too minimal damage from chewing worms but the dust is down and spinosad works really really well but I'm happy with this and I'll be doing this every year you know, to grow broccoli. I'm going to throw in cauliflower next year because this was a success. Sunflowers throughout. So it's weird though. I've had sunflowers all the time. I've never really noticed them causing a problem with, you know, competing against other plants, but maybe it's true. We'll see. This space is really maybe a testimony to me saying I'm not going to overplant my garden at the get-go. So I've got some squash or zucchini that I planted back there from seed. That's probably not even 14 days old. Save yourself some money. Just direct sow cucumbers, squash, zucchini. They take off. They grow really well. So I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be putting in here, but I like that I'm able to pace myself and I'm not overdoing it. I have two squash right here, two behind me. We'll see those. That's all I really need for a family of two, really for a family of four. Going to be doing a video on growing melons. Those are watermelons, cantaloupes that came back themselves. I'm going to keep two of them. One way I'm trellising a tomato up here is just weaving it in and out of the railing right there. Tree looks pretty good. Very few apples on it this year. Out of control, so I'm going to prune this back down. I mean, things look good. Here's an example of a broccoli plant. You know, the one in here, a little bit shaded. I already took one out of there. The ones in the sun, they've already loosened and flowered. So the shade cloth really does make a difference. Tomato plants are just doing really, really well. You know, slow and steady. They're nice and stocky. I'm pruning them. Here's the space too. Most of the lettuce is gone. The collards look good. The outer leaves of the collards are yellow. That's what my plants are starting to look like with a lack of watering. So bringing the watering back in, the plants are starting to take care of themselves, darken up, and you have to keep the watering in. Maybe this year, for one thing, is water a little bit more than you think. Maybe half your garden, or if you have a couple of the same plant, water half the plants more often. And just see if you notice a difference in how productive they are and how good they start to look. Let's see, what did I miss? Well, this is all cilantro, which I love letting grow. It reseeds itself. I use the seeds um, 
you know, in other parts of my property. It's just a free way to get seeds. However, the flowers bring in tons of pollinators. And again, we're here early in the morning. So like one strategy I use is put the dust down late in the evening, come out early in the morning, rinse it off, less risk to the pollinators. Cucumbers that I started from seed, I want to say that these aren't even 21 days old. I think that would be accurate. But look how good they look. Someone was just asking me in a comment, um, how much space do I put between the cucumbers? And I think they said something about 12 inches. A foot between plants is pretty good. I put two plants sometimes in a hole, so I have two, one, one, two. Just on the outer edge, I can let that second cucumber actually come this way. I'll be putting a trellis here. But about a foot apart, one plant per hole, four plants coming up the cattle panel side, that's plenty. And I'm gonna stress this again, these guys look good. They got the dust on there for the cucumber beetle from my last video I just did. When these get beat up, sometime in July, I'll be putting in new transplants or new seeds. Keep the cucumbers going, keep the zucchini going, keep the squash going. I just opened up the path in here so that it is a little more, you know, cottage style. It was totally closed over. Oh, and I also have mulched everything. I don't know if you caught it, but everything is mulched that I want to have mulched. Happy with the way that looks. Here are the two um, zucchini plants that I'm growing. So this one I was going to do an experiment and cut open a space to protect it from the vine borer. However, this is a bush variety. So the bush variety is a little bit different. The sprawling, um, more vine type zucchini plant will leave you a nice space where I think you can cut into that and disturb the vine borer's uh, life cycle. But I'll be talking more about that. So I have to pull one of these out because you don't want two plants competing like that. These are just going to get huge. Super hots look good. Celery back there looking good. Different turnips. The beets are going crazy. The kohlrabi is forming. About half of them are forming nice bulbs. So I'm happy with that. Mid-June, things are looking good. Now the garden was a little bit beat up because I was napping on the watering. Eating lots of the turnips out. I'm going to cut in, just show you what's growing in there. And I think, oh, I must have ate it. But they look pretty good. Here's a, a closer look. Just wanted to cut into the ramblings. This is one of the purple top turnips that I'm picking for dinner tonight. I'm going to make turnip mashed potatoes, which is basically 50% potatoes, 50% turnips. Just cook them like you're making mashed potatoes. It's really, really good together. I'll be using the greens. I want to grab one more. But I just want to show you the massive size of these turnips because it's almost whew, unbelievable. I mean, look at that. So I just need two turnips. Could have a lot of mashed potatoes, turnip mashed potatoes. I mean, that's perfect. You can't really beat this. Purple tops you can grow throughout the summer too. They're not just cool weather crops. They may not get as big, maybe a little beat up in July, but you know, keep them coming if you enjoy turnips. Let me spin around so my shadow's not in everything. Highly watered Swiss chard in a 22 gallon container. It looks good. I'll show you the one that wasn't getting frequent waterings. Bush cucumbers from transplants looking good, getting ready to trellis up. The dill's all coming in. I've got some basil in there garlic. The pods from the radishes are absolutely delicious. You can use those wherever you want in your cooking. Here's a weaker guy getting less water. And you know, it's just an easy way to show that watering makes a difference. So this guy really needs some fertilizer, some more water, and everything about this is smaller. Smaller garlic, smaller Swiss chard. You know, it's not, I don't want to say it's common sense because Watering is so difficult to understand. Look, that's a beautiful horseradish plant. Lots of water going into there. The plants are geared to produce. Those are the peppers that I had uh, in my sunken cold frame. They're all taking off. Again, the watering. So plants get enough water maybe once a week to stay alive and produce. But if you really want them to thrive, it's jacking up the frequency of watering. Things look pretty good in here. Containers. Lettuce, that's all coming out, and we're going to be eating a lot of that today when my friends come over. Looking good. Peas, these were the first peas I got in. They're starting to fade. Second peas that I got in, not fading as much. And if I spin around 
this way. Those are looking good. Just keep it really, really well watered. There's my peppermint oil spray that I've been using. This maybe was the third planting of peas. They're looking good, nice and green. And that's why you want to do succession plantings because you don't want everything to fade out at once like the peas you saw first. You don't want every pea coming in at once because it's really hard to eat all that. Kohlrabi's looking good. How to make a choice. I yanked the tomato out that was growing there. It was a little bit sad. It even has a tomato on there. But it just, because of all the root systems there, just wasn't thriving and I'm like all right do I really need another tomato plant over here and the answer was no so I removed it potatoes looking good beets looking good well watered this is really bizarre I don't know if that was like a mole or a vole tunnel that collapsed when I watered but it's odd but keeping this well watered the plants have all perked up more French fingerlings with that indeterminate long vine Kale looks good, red Russian kale. Trick here too is I need to eat it. If I just keep letting this sit here and sit here and sit here, pretty soon it's gonna be covered in insects. So you don't wanna have so much that you have planted that you're just taking care of it, keeping pests off, keeping disease off, but you're not eating it. If you're eating it, you're gonna have less pest problems, less disease problems. Let's go over to um, my other garden and we'll end there. This is a view that you see often, so I just want to show you again just how much the garden has grown. The sunflowers look spectacular. This is kale that overwintered, and I decided to keep it. Usually, I pull it out after I eat the flowers and the blooms, but I cut them back, and the plant looks pretty good. You know, so nice small leaves. Again, if I'm not harvesting this regularly, white flies are going to move in, so I'm going to have problems. So as nice as this looks, if I'm not going to eat it or use it, I'm just really making a home for white flies and other problems. So you have to make decisions on what you want to keep in your garden for looks, for appeal, for your mindset, for your wellness, but also are you eating it quick enough? If not, is it going to cause a problem for you? I'll be doing a trellising video this week just going over options for people. This is my other garden. This is really was the idea was to plant up the plants that I got in Portugal. Some of them did well, some of them have not. Container peppers, spectacular. Shadier here, so this garden still was getting enough sunlight, still gets enough sunlight, like eight hours, versus my other garden I just showed you that you can get up to 10, sometimes even more sunlight. So the hot sun dries it out really quick. More shade here, eight hours of sunlight. The plants are better, I didn't have to water as much. So, container potatoes look good. I have more onions in there. Some cabbages, beans from Portugal, doing okay. Had to pull out some of the turnips. They just weren't doing what they wanted to do. But look at all the potatoes. 20 gallon root pouches, which I sell at my seed shop. They're gonna keep going for several more weeks. So the potatoes are developing now. This was maybe like the third wave of potatoes I planted. Again, succession makes a difference. Peppers from Portugal, just pruned back. I forgot these guys back here. They were flopped over all over the place. You can see the tomatoes, if you can recall, they're not as thick and strong as the ones that are in that, in my other garden with the 10 hours of sun or more. So sunlight does really impact more different plants. Potatoes seem to do fine with less here. Tomatoes probably want a little bit more, but they're gonna produce. So when you talk about sunlight, it's not every plant needs six hours, every plant needs eight hours, every plant must have 12. It really depends on the plant variety. I didn't show you the eggplant on the other side, but eggplant here, love the warmth. They do best right in the spot, that's why I put two in, with less sunlight, but they're gonna be massive and they're nice and green. So you really have to learn what your plants like. So if you have a, a garden that has different um, amounts of sunlight throughout the property, with time you can learn what grows best where and you'll be able to adjust your garden so you can maximize you know, the harvest by putting the plants really in the right place. And we're going to end here. This is going to be a cucumber trellis. I just dropped seeds down there. I think this is maybe 10 bucks from some thrift store. It's going to get secured to these posts because it's not really super secure in the ground. But I think that's going to look really cool for cucumbers. So you can use different things for trellising and just be creative. I mean, I've got the cattle panel tunnel. Everything is coming into play. The garden looks 
as good as it does in my opinion because I really started focusing on the water about eight days ago. Like I totally slept on it because I'm like, oh, this is what it is every year, plenty of rain. And, I, and it wasn't and I just didn't pay attention to it. Thanks so much for watching. Please check out my seed shop at therustedgarden.com. Slow and steady with the garden, I like to say, builds the garden. You don't have to do everything every day, but really think about watching how the plants grow in different sunlight, different parts of your garden. And if you have time, change plants around this year, a little bit here, a little bit there. See how they grow, and then come next year, you can place them in the place they do best. Thanks so much for watching.